Who's suffering in the deepest depths of hell? Well, you can't really be sure, but if you want to take Dante Alighieri's account of it, it, there are three people down there. And this video is going to be on who they are and why they are there. In fact, there's, there's actually two answers to this, okay? There's a simple answer, and then there's a, a realer answer, a more complete answer, and we're going to have both of them. Now, Dante, of course, is most famous for writing the Divine Comedy, the most popular portion of which is called The Inferno, where he goes through the depths of hell, visiting all, all people from classical antiquity and people of his own time who were suffering for their sins in hell. Now, at the very bottom of hell, it's nice and simple. Here is the vision of what he sees. He sees Satan, who for, first off is not only punishing, but is being punished. Satan is a three-headed beast monster with giant wings that flap and make the rest of hell extremely cold. Hell is actually cold, according to Dante. But in Satan's three mouths are three of the worst possible sinners. One of them is, of course, Judas Iscariot. That, of course, is an easy answer. Judas, of course, is the person who betrayed Jesus. The other two men in the other two mouths of Satan are Brutus and Cassius, the betrayers of Caesar. Now, why exactly are they in the deepest depths of hell? Well, first off, if you've ever heard of Brutus and Cassius, at least in the English-speaking world, you're probably familiar with them from Shakespeare's play, which you probably read in high school, called Julius Caesar, where Brutus and Cassius are sort of dramatized. Now, of course, the Shakespeare's dramatization is not necessarily history. In that particular play, Brutus is depicted as being sort of an honorable Roman who, although is friends with Caesar, feels he must betray him because Caesar is undermining the Republic. Whereas Cassius is just sort of a jealous man. Many of the other people assassinating Caesar are uh, depicted as being jealous. Either way, that's actually Shakespeare's embellishment in actual history. We don't actually know their motivations. And when Dante, who of course was writing before Shakespeare, uh, when Dante depicted both of them, he depicted them as being both terrible traitors and they're in the bottom most of hell. Now, the simple reason for why they're there is that Dante considers the absolute worst sin to be the sin of betraying a benefactor. That is not just betraying family, not just betraying friends, but a benefactor, someone who has done good to you with no reason, for really no reason. They have no obligation, but they have done their best to, to do good to you. Um, that is, Judas Iscariot has, of course, betrayed his very savior, but Julius Caesar also did incredibly good to Brutus and Cassius. For example, he had uh, pardoned Brutus uh, after he sided with an enemy of him, uh, an enemy of his, and Brutus and, and Cassius and Caesar should have all gotten along. They, Caesar had been very benevolent to them. Nonetheless, they betrayed him. So that is the simple reason as for why they're in the bottommost reaches of hell. And there are only three people who uh, have committed this sin, at least that Dante depicts in its most extreme form. And they are being, being eaten by Satan over and over again. He's constantly chewing on them and they're being regenerated and eaten. That, that is their punishment. Now, what is the real reason that these people are in hell? Why does Dante actually depict them there? In order to really understand why these people are in hell, you have to understand Dante's I, I don't want to say ideology, but his vision of the universe, his vision not just of religion, but of politics. The, you know, these particular people who betrayed Caesar uh, have committed a theological sin. They've gone against God's plan in a significant way. And here is Dante's actual view of this, okay? You have to look in another thing that Dante wrote, not in a, a, a work of fiction, but a work called De Monarchia. That's the Latin name of it. It's sometimes translated, literally, I guess you could translate it as on monarchy. It's usually translated on as on empire. That might be a little more accurate in his original meaning. But in this book, Dante outlines his vision of the, the entire plan of all of the world. That is, he specifically argues um, that there needs to be, it is God's plan that there be one universal government empire ruling the entire known world. And he argues this for multiple reasons. For example, he says that uh, the ideal state is one that ensures peace, that there's no international war, and that is one where the king rules and the king rules over all. There's, there's no division of who, you know, here's a king versus there's a king and they're fighting amongst each other. There's one universal rule, which is analogous to the rule of heaven, where God is the monarch, God is the emperor 
of the entire world. Additionally, he argues that when Jesus lived, Jesus had to be born during a period of universal empire. And that's because when Jesus was crucified, when Jesus was sentenced to death, he was sentenced to death by Pontius Pilate, who, of course, was working on the behalf, he was judging on the behalf of the universal Roman Empire. And Dante's point is that in order for Jesus' execution, which in many respects is illegitimate in the view of Christians, but in order for it to have been uh, ruled upon, it had to be legitimate in the eyes of a universal empire. It couldn't, Jesus couldn't be sentenced to death in like rural Wales, you know, during this period. He had to be sentenced to death in a universal empire. And the coming to be of that universal empire was, of course, part of God's plan. Now, actually, there's a, a lot of interesting things we can say about Dante's specific politics here, because Dante is speaking at a period where the main political conflict uh, was that between secular authority and church authority. Now, Dante, to sum things up, to, to write, to paint in generalities, Dante is a proponent of secular authority. That is, there were many people at that period who thought the Pope, who was the ruler of the church, should also be a, a ruler of the political realm. He should rule sort of like, a since he's the vicar of Christ on earth, he should also be a political leader as well. And we really should be le living in an uh, uh, empire organized around religious authority. Dante and others disagreed with this. In fact, Dante was a big fan of the Holy Roman Emperor and the Holy Roman Empire, which, you know, people make fun of it because they say, oh, it's not really Roman, it's not really, blah, 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 because it was centered on, like, Germany and stuff like that. But Dante and others viewed the Holy Roman Empire as the legitimate heir of Rome. And their view was that secular authority is something different. We have to have someone who is, you know, caring for man's different material needs, making sure that there is peace, and that is something different from his spiritual needs. Now, Dante, of course, argues this isn't like modern uh, sort of secularism versus religious authority. This isn't quite exactly the same because Dante's view is, that, you know, the material world exists for spiritual ends. The reason we want universal peace, a universal empire, is so people can have the best, the, the optimal environment to reach salvation. Okay, that is the goal of secular rule. But Dante's view is that it's a, it's a different thing. It can't be the same thing as papal authority. It has to be something different. So in the political environment at Dante's day, Dante took the side, he was uh, aligned with factions that took the side of the Holy Roman Emperor in most political disputes, while others took the side of the Pope and the Papal States. And in fact, Dante had been exiled in his life, uh, you know, before the writing of the Divine Comedy by these, uh, the, the pro-Papal faction. And of course, in his Inferno, he writes about many of his political enemies suffering, you know, as, as sort of a, you know, just to own them or whatever. But anyway, this should be a little clearer why Brutus and Cassius are depicted in hell. They're in hell because Dante's view is that God's plan, not just for politics, but also for salvation, is that there needs to be a universal Roman emperor. That is part of the plan. So Brutus and Cassius, although they're betraying people, they're betraying their, their friend and benefactor Caesar, they're actually doing something they might not even realize, but they, they're doing something much more evil. That is, they're standing in the way of God's plan. God's plan is that the Roman people will rule over a universal uh, empire. And this, this was actually sort of, the, you know, there's a view nowadays that... Uh, uh, or I, I guess we have this view of Christian, uh, you know, Christendom of Christianity as if um, Christianity, you know, God didn't have any other plans outside of the Jews. And, you know, the Messiah was born to the Jews and, you know, everyone else was just sort of languishing and, you know, there was no plan for them. That is not the view that people in the medieval ages and the Renaissance and early Christians had. Because Dante, as others, he thinks, for example, the Romans have a unique covenant with God that they... Uh, eventually have to come to rule the world. And the Greeks have a unique covenant with God in that they're given particular philosophical approaches that prepare them for the, er, you know, the er, uh, arrival of Christian theology, all this kind of stuff. So Dante's view is that Brutus and Cassius are fundamentally doing something theologically evil. They are standing in the way of inevitability. They were living at the cusp of the Roman Empire, a time where there was, finally, God's plan was finally coming to fruition. There was going to be one man, Julius Caesar, who ruled the entire world, and that was it. 
and they stood in the way and they said, no, we don't want that. We don't want any of that. We're going to, for our own reasons, maybe because we're jealous, maybe because we believe in, you know, the Republic or something like that. But for our own reasons, we are going to stand in the way of inevitability. And of course, God's plan in, in both ca- in the case of Judas Iscariot betraying Jesus, obviously that was sort of played into the plan of being crucified. But additionally, Brutus and Cassius play into to the plan as well, because although they killed Julius Caesar, what happens? The emperor, the empire starts. In fact, their assassination uh, serves as a pretext for a civil war where eventually Octavian Augustus becomes the the original first emperor. So all these people, although they stood in the way, they utterly failed. And that's Dante's view. And when you look at Dante's Inferno with this viewpoint, the idea that it is building to some kind of culmination of the Roman Empire, a lot of other things make sense. For example, if you read in school the Iliad and the Odyssey, you know, of course, the hero of the Odyssey is this guy, Odysseus, the guy who made the Trojan horse. Okay, but if you read Dante's Inferno, you find that this hero is reduced to actually he's pretty deep in hell. You know, some of the heroes, they're in limbo. They're in the place in hell where there's no suffering as uh, Dante depicts them. Um, But Odysseus is actually very he's a schemer. So he's depicted as being very deep in there, despite the fact that he's a hero. He's a hero in the eyes of the Greeks. Now, if you're a very superficial literary analyst, you'll be like, well, that's just because Dante was like, you know, he was ethnocentric and he didn't like Greeks. I mean, that is not the answer. It's not the answer because Dante's vision, it's not that he doesn't like Greeks, but in Greek history, Greeks constantly stand against the Roman Empire. And of course, the Trojan War, you know, Romans... Uh, you know, since the time of, of uh, uh, you know, Aeneas, or well, not really since Aeneas, but since the Aeneid was written by Virgil, um, there was the idea that Romans come from Troy. So these Greeks who are fighting against Trojans in the Trojan War are depicted as sort of bad guys, including Odysseus. Odysseus, of course, comes up with the idea of the Trojan horse. And so all of these Greeks are sort of thought of as villains, even though in Greek literature, of course, they're, you know, they're, they're the heroes. So it's not just, oh, well, they're a different culture than me or something like that. It's that in Dante's view, all of these people are fighting against the fact that Romans will become the preeminent ruling class of the world. That is their, that's their issue. Okay. So And in each case, the Greeks fail to extinguish the Trojans. Aeneas runs away from Troy. He founds Rome. Well, he doesn't found Rome, but his ancestors uh, or his his descendants found Rome. So anyway, that, that is the point. That is why Brutus and Cassius are, along with Judas Iscariot, in the deepest depths of hell. Hopefully you understand that. You might not even, you might not have even heard of that, but that is why they're there.